International Radio Tours broadcasting program is designed to assist artists, writers, producers, musicians, published authors and organizations promoting their work throughout the world. To learn more visit online at internationalradiotours.org. Welcome to International Radio Tours, a partnering program with Storytellers Campfire Radio. And our programs are broadcasting today from KNJO, Thousand Oaks, XRQK Los Angeles, Airtime America, and XRQK Media Group Stations and Affiliates. I'm your host, Rich Galhausen. With us today is John Knuckle, award-winning author and host of the radio program, Don't Give Up Your Daydream. We'll preview John's book, Grit, the second book in his trilogy, uh, his trilogy of The Vig, Grit, and Blind Trust. And we'll have dramatic readings from Grit. We'll discuss the characters portrayed in the readings. International Radio Tour's preview program of The Grit, of the Vig is archived and available at www.internationalradiotours.org. Just click on the uh, video or the author's page. And on www.storytellerscampfire.org, where you can just click on the author's page. The programs are also archived at www.spreaker.com forward slash Storytellers Campfire, www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Storytellers Campfire, and www.youtube.com under the VIG by John Knuckle. Well, now we'll take a commercial break. We'll be right back with author John Knuckle. Learning and good nutrition does not end when school lets out. The USDA's Summer Food Service Program helps provide nutritious meals to children in low-income areas so they're better fueled with healthy food to learn and grow. To learn more about sponsoring a feeding site in your community, go to www.summerfood.usda.gov. Welcome back to International Radio Tours. This is your host, Rich Galhausen. And joining us today is author John Knuckle. Hello, John, and welcome to our program. Hi, Rich. How are you? I'm doing good, John, and how are you, and how are things in New York? Uh, I'm very good, and it is very hot, Uh, but it's (laughs) good to be indoors. It's an indoor day, even though it's a nice sunny summer day, but it's, it's a little hot out here. As long as you have a little air conditioning. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, John, uh, we're going to get into your book, uh, Grit. We're going to have some dramatic readings. Um, Before we start, uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself. uh, uh, We're going to lead into uh, our dramatic readings. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and what we're doing today. Sure, sure. Well, this is very exciting for me. This is uh, the first time I'm actually going to hear uh, my words spoken or acted out by uh, other people. And there's also uh, a surprise that I'll I'll mention after the first set of readings. 
But, uh, you know, this really is the culmination of a few years where I started, you know, I wrote the VIG that was originally what I called my story from my experiences, working downtown, working on the trading floor and all the things uh, that, you know, came around that. And I wrote Grit, the one, the book that we're discussing today, as the sequel to the VIG. Now, I never intended to write a trilogy, and let alone, a, you know, a sequel, or a sequel, let alone a trilogy, but uh, I just love the story so much. I love the characters so much. And uh, so I started writing Grit. And once I finished Grit, then I just I fell in love with the, the whole idea and the concept. And, you know, I, I started feeling like I, I had this long story I wanted to tell, which I'm thinking now it may not be a, a trilogy. May, I think there's going to be a fourth one that's right. rattling around inside my head. Uh, but the grit is uh, grit is uh, you know it's a straight up sequel and it starts day one of grit is the last day of the vig so that's how they lead into each other so it is uh, like a companion piece almost. Mm-hmm. When we start our uh, dramatic readings, uh, we're going to be starting with one of the uh, the primary characters in your book uh, uh, with Carla. Mm-hmm. And uh, maybe we should talk about Carla just a little bit before we have that first dramatic reading. Okay. Well, you'll see in the first uh, reading is she is a survivor. She's a strong, strong female uh, character. You know, she's she's uh, athletic. She's tough. She's vicious. She's mean. But she's a survivor. But you'll see as uh, these readings go on and as, uh, you know, when you read the books... Uh, she is very, very troubled also. So, you know, outwardly strong, powerful. Inwardly, she is, uh, you know, very, very flawed. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that combination, you know, comes to a head at times, and uh, the reaction's usually pretty explosive. Well, maybe we should go ahead and start with that first reading. Um, Let's go ahead and have that. I uh, want the audience to listen closely. All right. They're on the roof, Carla Puglisi said aloud as she reached for her marrow glove cross trainers. She had been awaiting the men to determine her escape route. She slipped the trainers over her water-repellent socks. Since they had the roof, she would get out through the tunnel. She spotted them this afternoon, two men, clean-cut athletic. It was clear they were not sent by her family. Her uncle arranged all of her hits for years. It was inevitable that one day he would send someone to put her down. No, these men were of a different breed. They looked like marines or maybe seals. It didn't matter. Carla had a tactical advantage over them and all but a handful of athletes in the world. She was a 5.15 climber on the Yosemite grading scale. Carla just had to get them to the mountains. She spotted them on the bench in front of the new Sheridan Hotel on Colorado Avenue. They couldn't know that the bench had a special meaning to her. She had lost a dear friend once whom she had met on that bench. 
She spent many afternoons standing in front of the floor-to-ceiling windows of her loft looking down at that bench. She would wait until sunset when the glare would obscure her presence from the street. It was this afternoon, looking down at the bench, that she spotted the first man. He had his sunglasses lowered on his nose and was staring up at her window. It was clear he wasn't from town. His clothes were new yet outdated. He seemed to be staring at her building intently, surveying it. Carla sat at the window and watched him watch her. After an hour of observation, the second man sat next to him without acknowledgement. The lack of recognition stood out. This was Telluride, Colorado, not New York City or Brooklyn where she grew up. People say hello here. She watched as the first man rose and walked up Colorado and made a deliberately wide path to cross the street. He turned left down Willow Street towards the back of her building. He passed out of sight. She grabbed her pack to load her gear. Carla killed seven men in the last five years. She left the eighth alive, a mistake she would never repeat. These two would make it nine. As the men tried best to walk silently across her roof, she went to the hatch in the floor and opened it and made sure the ladder was still in place. Her loft used to be a storage room above her custom leather shop, The Roost. The hatch was part of the original design of allowing the loading of supplies when her shop was a dry goods store. The men couldn't know about the hatch as a method of escape. They couldn't have read the blueprints. The building went up in 1893. There were none. Before she headed down the ladder, she took a brief moment to look at herself in the full-length mirror. She wore black Under Armour stretch pants and a stretch zip up to top. Carla was proud of her body. She had worked for it, worked on it, for years. She was a black stallion. She was perfect. Carla checked into the Hilton on 6th Avenue. The first night, she stayed at a cash dump on 11th Avenue. She thought it would be best to wait a day before checking into a real hotel. Using cash would cause attention here, so she wanted to make sure the card was still untraceable. She bought dinner and lunch with it yesterday, and nothing has happened. She should be fine by now. The place was crazy crowded, but... She figured it would be best to be lost amid a crowd. She t- checked in using her card and slept. She slept from 8 p.m. until noon, showered, ordered blueberry pancakes and bacon from room service, and slept some more. The sleep was dreamless, heavy, and black. At 7.40 the next morning, she jumped with a start, the covers laying at her feet as if she were tied down, She kicked her legs and swung her arms free. It took a moment to realize where she was. She was soaked with sweat. After her second glorious shower, Carla dressed in jeans and a sweater and looked into the mirror on the back of the closet door. She looked too conspicuous. Carla was proud of her body and the work she had put into sculpting it. She was also aware, without ego, that when she walked into a room, people noticed. There would be men in the lobby downstairs that will stare and remember her. That wouldn't do for the tasks ahead. 
It was time to buy some loose fitting.